I think one of the few that that got me was um, Tom Hanks. I did a little thing with Tom Hanks, a little movie with Tom Hanks, and and I was standing in front of him, and I just kept saying, "You're Tom Hanks. You're talking. You're <laughs> addressing. You're throwing words at me." And all I keep thinking is, "You're Tom Hanks. You're Tom Hanks. Wow, you are Tom Hanks." <laughs> you know? Welcome to SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Perry Nemroff from Collider. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We have Victoria Pedretti. Hello. Wilmer Val Valderrama. Jalen Barron. And Quentin Player. Hello, hello. Congratulations on the many accomplishments all of you have achieved across the board. All right, so I'm putting you all to the test right out the gate here with a dangerous group Zoom question. So whoever feels like they want to jump in first, go for it. I want to know what is the, when you were first starting out in this industry, what did you think step one to becoming a working actor was? And now looking back, having done it, would you recommend that first step to another aspiring actor or did you find something that was more effective along the way? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, ladies first. Anybody wants to go first? <laughs> um, I would say that I thought that the first step was to sign with the people at the mall who approach you. <laughs> and they're oh, like, hey, yes. oh, man. please come to this giant casting call and they're going to read a little script off of a piece of paper and then you guys give us $100 a month and then we're going to sign you. You guys are going to be famous. <laughs> if that step, it's not real. Don't fall for it. Any agency who wants your money at first, you know, just to be there with them is not real. I thought that was a necessary step. Was very hurt to find out that it wasn't. Glad I didn't do it. That's a, that's actually a great thing. The My first step was actually one of those um, uh, giant showcase things. I think it all, I think it everybody. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but I did actually get my first agent. Hit it in the southeast, you know. Eventually moved to Los Angeles, and that was my first step. You know, I ne I wouldn't necessarily advise it, you know, nowadays, but it was my first step, and it wasn't a complete scam. I'll say, you know, it actually did work for me. So, mm -hmm. Victoria, uh, I went to a four-year university. A little mm -hmm. bit of a scam. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally unnecessary. Definitely training is really important and empowering, but um, not necessarily that track. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, I, I shared, um, it's so funny, Jalen and uh, Quentin, I, I literally, uh, I can take a pisk of this one, a pisk of this one and make the secret potion for this anecdote because I was driving on the 101 freeway with my father and then the radio station said, are you between the ages of uh, uh, 12, 15? You know, do you think you got what it takes to be a superstar? Well, mm -hmm. learn from the best. Da, 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 da. We're doing a seminar at, uh, you know, at the, at the Hilton uh, LAX. Uh, come bring your parents and see if you got what it takes. So cut to, hey, dad, you know what I heard it was cool? If like if I did commercials and I, you know, like I, you know, I could, could make some money and I, you know, can contribute at the house. My dad's like, ha, 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 ha. okay, mijo, you can do that. And <laughs> he basically said, all right, let's go. And then we checked it out. And I literally the same thing. I, what was very funny is that they put you on stage, you walk straight on this stage, you look at this camera and you go, and you're supposed to say your name and your age. Right. And at the time I was like, hi, my name is Rune Valderrama and I'm 16 years old. And and then they bring you down and then the judges go, mm -hmm. he goes, you got what it takes. And ultimately they give you this package, right? Package one is call reading and commercial acting. Package two is call reading, commercial acting and dramatic scenes, you know? And it was that kind of stuff. So, you know, we couldn't really afford much. So we just did like the call reading and the little sprinkle of commercial and stuff. But, but um, I would say that it's important that you vet um, you vet these opportunities and that you, you look at the track record, but ask around before you write a check. Sometimes these are most of the savings that your parents are doing for the heavy days and they're doing it because they're supporting you sometimes, you know, or sometimes it's everything you've saved and you thought this is the way you got to do, you know? So, um, and then looking back, 
I would definitely would have asked more questions about the likability of getting representation, how to get representation, because getting representation is absolutely 100% free. Uh, so to Jalen's point, uh, yeah, you know, definitely you don't need to pay anyone to represent you or send you on additions. You know, that becomes a partnership later. Oh, I have so many follow-up questions and I'm going to continue with what you just brought up, Wilmer and Jalen. I'm going to throw this to you because I was doing a little light Googling and I did read that you signed with your representation last summer. So can you tell us a little bit about figuring out when is the right time to seek representation and also what was important for you to see in the companies and the people that you would ultimately sign with? Okay, so I had representation since I was 13 with um, Discover Management and Ospring. So those were my OG agents and managers, Deborah Lynn, shout out to her, love her. Um, and then recently I just transitioned over to, you know, who I'm with now. And I think, you know, it's hard to make that step in the journey of acting because you, you know, especially if you're a loyal person and you're with somebody for so long, you don't want to leave and it's hard to do so. And it feels heavy on your heart, but you have to know that, you know, God has you on the right path and these things happen and you have to, you know, go through these doors. And unfortunately that means maybe not leaving somebody behind, but just closing the door behind you and maybe they'll be able to open it for somebody else. You know, without those people that I started with, I wouldn't be anywhere where I'm at right now. And I think that there's not a clear sign to know when you're ready to move on. You just really have to feel it and then go for it. And it's scary, but that's growth is feeling uncomfortable. And I felt uncomfortable and I knew that's why I had to go. So that, that was my biggest lesson of the year is, is growth. And it was scary, but I did it, took a plunge. Here I am. I'm okay. And I'm breathing. <laughs> <laughs> scary steps are vital sometime. All right. I'm going to go back to what you brought up, Victoria, because I know that you, you made the leap from college, like pretty much straight to your first big gig, which of course was Haunting of Hill House. You know, I love that show so, so much. What is the key to being brand new in this industry and leaving college and starting to get access to auditions like that? Um, okay, so my university had a showcase at the end of, you know, at the end of our four years. That's not necessarily true. I've heard about universities in which the expectation is that even when they have a showcase, it's the student's job to invite people there. Mm. The school I went to was like, reputable enough that they've been doing it this long that they have relationships with people and so they like invite them themselves huge resource again like four years a little bit of a scam got a lot out of it still you know what i mean um so that's ultimately how i got representation which is a huge part of how i got um uh, hill house you know and being really shrewd about you know asking questions and thinking about the career that you want for yourself. Um, I think there's a lot of value in saying yes to the opportunities that arise, but there's a lot of power in saying no as well. Um, and you can, you can start thinking about that really early. Um, yeah. And then I was really lucky that I looked like a bunch of other people that were already cast as a family. You know, there's so much <laughs> luck involved in all of it as well. That's true. And you earned the role. I'm actually going to throw what you just brought up to the entire group, because especially when you're first starting out in this industry, saying no to something can be one of the scariest, most challenging things. So can you each recall a time, whether it's early on or recently, when, you know, you had to put your foot down and say no to something, whether it's something that you were asked to do on set or a project that just didn't feel right to you. And that was the best move for you at the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it off because something just popped straight to my head. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was on the show and, you know, really thankful for the show, but it wasn't something I wanted to just continue uh, doing for a long time. And so they came to me with the offer of being a series regular um, and locking in for six years at the time. Um, and it was it, it was at a time where I hadn't gotten the kind of string that I've had lately and so the numbers that they threw out were numbers I had never seen before you know um and I was like man I always told myself I would never make decisions based on finances in this career you know like if I do what I want to do and stay with the quality that I want to stay with and stay creatively you know excited and the money will come um and so I had to I had to turn it down cold and it was 
it was tough, but I was really proud because it was like, man, all that, I'm not sure if we can curse, but like all that shit that I've talked all these years about who, you know, I said I was going to be when the time came, I actually am that person. You know, it's easy to say you're going to do this and you're going to do that. You will care about this. But when they throw, you know, the, <laughs> the numbers in your face that change your life and you still make the decision you said you were going to make all those years. Uh, I think for me, it, it was empowering in a way because it was like, I've got integrity. You know, I, mm -hmm. I am who I said I am. And, and with that, it was just like, all right, I turned this down and it all ended up working out. You know, we worked something out where I came back on a, in a way that wasn't, um, wasn't exclusive time-wise and it wasn't, you know, tied in for six years, but I didn't know it when I turned it down. Um, and yeah, I think it just gave me like that thing. Like, you know, I remember I was, I was at my parents' house cause it was during COVID and I, I walked down the stairs and I was like, well, we're about to see, cause you know, I don't have anything now. Uh, and I just had this feeling of like, let's go get it. Like, you know, like, I, I don't know. I just felt excited. And yeah, I don't know something about just saying that no made me know every time I went into an audition room or, or whatever, I had to go that much harder because it's like, I got to make up for that no that I said, you know, I can't <laughs> say one thing and now let myself down. So, um, yeah, you know, for me, it's, it's happened to work out, but I think some Victoria said it was like, like a lot of this is luck, you know, and it doesn't matter how, cause we're all talented. We're all talented. And I go back to my class that I came up in in Atlanta recently. Um, and I was just like, man, you all are incredible. And you all have grown so much since I left but you know, haven't necessarily had the same steps and, and successes that I, I've had. And it just makes me know, like, just uh, stay so humble in this and, and, and hungry in this. And, and it makes me even more want to stick to, like, if something feels right, you have to say no, because you're now at this luxury where you actually can. And I don't know, this weird thing. And I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling now, but that's, that's my answer to that question. Well said, though. Good example right there. Anyone else have a have a no example they want to share? I mean, it's hard work that requires a lot of us, like personally and emotionally to be doing something. It's not like it's mundane. It's not like it's like putting in the numbers. You know, we're passionate about the work we do. And to go about that in a way that isn't like 100 percent is so soul crushing, um, you know, no matter how much you're being pay frankly i mean like and there is more opportunity to be had and you know happy for the person who got that money um i i've i've like i've i've been there and i've walked away from something also that could have you know made a impact like that mm -hmm. and it really reminds you who who the hell you are mm -hmm. Wilmer, I'll come your way now because Quentin just put the long running show thing in my brain and you have two series with especially high episode counts. So I was wondering, what did you learn from doing a long running show like that 70s show that you were able to apply to NCIS and, you know, make that make that process maybe a little easier than your first time around with a show like that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate the leading into that. And uh, uh, Quinn, I, I I feel your your dilemma there too. And uh, Victoria, same. You know, I think I, when I started performing, it was towards the uh, end of the '90s. Um, I was 17, 18 years old. Um, you know, it was very limited the amount of roles that I could actually be right for, and uh, and and therefore some of us didn't really have, um, you know, a lot of choices. If we wanted to work, we kind of had to just take one for the team and just take the experience, you know. Um, but when it comes to the long run so long of run. it all, uh, was it, it was a really interesting thing. You know, I, when I was presented with an opportunity to audition for that 70 show, I, I just thought, you know, oh, cool. Like, it's a, another audition, you know, and you're, you're going from audition to audition. You're just hoping that you can get closer to a second or third callback. And then you're just in the five-year line. And that to me was the win yeah. back then. For me, it was just like getting callbacks, was telling my agents, don't drop me, please. Cause I think <laughs> I'll get something anytime soon, you know, um, you know, as you're related to, to making a decision that could, you know, that can last a long time and you being happy with yourself in the process, um, there's two things, right? Um, uh, I want to offer the first. The first is when, when I when I started on that 70 show, uh, what it taught me was, you know, it taught me this effortless and naive aura um, that um, that I could allow myself to to have fun. 
you know, and, and uh, that was the first thing, you know, I think somebody, somebody, uh, uh, so Kerwood Smith, who plays Red Foreman on the show, he plays the father on, on that 70s show. He, he was really good friends with Robin Williams and Robin Williams had come to visit the set during the first year. And I was about 18 years old and I went up to Robin Williams and I said, sir, a word of advice for a young buck like me. And he said, uh, yeah, two words of advice. Uh, remember and never forget uh, that your fans, because you will have fans. He goes, but we'll have at least two to three minutes of your time for the, for the rest of their life. So what two to three minutes you want them to walk away with? And second, he goes, remember and never forget that it's supposed to be fun, you know? And I didn't really know what that meant until I started really practicing the choices, right? Saying no to things that I don't know, that looks like a lot of fun to play. I don't know if that show seems like I'm going to have a good time, you know, uh, going uh, around for that. So my philosophy was that if I was going to accept a show based on its potential, no matter what the money, like you said, Grant, like up or down, doesn't, it really didn't matter. I never, and I promise you, I, I never looked at my bank accounts ever in my career. And I still don't even look at a bank account. I just... Mm -hmm. I look at my opportunities and I just relentless to express, express, you know, and, and, and expose myself to opportunities, you know, but, but that the point was that if I'm going to sign up to a show and I'm going to do, who knows, at most successful nowadays, hundred episodes, uh, 200 episodes, like I did on the 70 show, if you're going to spend 10 to 12 hours a day for a day episodes, for about 22 episodes a year with somebody, you better like that person. So I so I went on to just develop characters that I loved playing so much that no matter what I was on, at the very least, no matter how that show turned out, whether it was a success or a failure, it didn't hit the mark, it just didn't last as long, that at the very least I can go home and go to sleep happy knowing that I developed a character that I like hanging with, you know, because you're going to play this guy for a long time. And, you know, I'm, I'm going almost 200 episodes on, on NCIS right now. And um, and I love my character. Do I love every case of the week? Absolutely not. <laughs> Out of 22 episodes a season, not 22 episodes are going to be bangers, okay? But, but I will say, I'm just keeping it as real as possible, um, having the safety of just saying, no, I'm not going to play the character um, far from my strength is, is, is what kept me in power. That's All right. I'm going to bottle some of that up and I'm throwing it your way, Jalen, just with the idea of starting in this industry so young and also having creative power over the projects and the characters that you play. So I know you got your start on things like Disney and Nickelodeon stuff, and I'm sure you had a wonderful experience doing that. But do you remember the first onset experience you had where you noticed that you were kind of being treated like an adult where you could feel and hear your creative input being considered in a, in a different way. And you could feel the power you could have over the projects that you take. Yes, I do. You know, okay. So of, of course, like in the beginning of your career and then being 13 years old, you're not really speaking up and you're just saying yes to whatever the producers and the directors are saying, because you're afraid to get fired, to be honest, right? So we fast forward to um, Free Rain, for example. I was 19 when I was filming that. And this was the first time I ever had my own series. And, and they're like, okay, so Jalen, what do you think of this? And I'm like, well, I just don't think Zoe would say that. Why is Zoe being so nosy? And it felt so freeing to finally be heard and have an opinion and be able to think about an audience and like how are they going to accept it are they going to like it are they going to enjoy it I wouldn't I wouldn't hang out with this girl me personally so would they want to and I remember just being in awe on set and just like watching everything in motion and then watching the scene and you know tweaking my lines and then just it coming together and watching people respond to it felt amazing and I I remember never wanting to forget that feeling. So then later on, I booked blind spotting and then I got even more of an opportunity. So I was behind the monitors being like, um, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, Trish would sit down that way or walk this way or even say that. And Rafael and David were so are so amazing and they're such amazing writers that, you know, they they took everything I said into consideration and they molded Trish into me. She was this so like this separate girl at first. And then once they got to know me, they're like, well, what would Jalen say? Jalen, what would you say to that? And I would tell them and they would write it down. 
And it made me feel good. And like, wow, I'm a serious actress. And I always felt like acting was like this separate thing from me, almost, if that makes sense. I don't know if you guys can relate. Like, like my character wasn't a part of me because I didn't get to have any say. So finally, mm-hmm. I felt like I got to put myself in these different girls like you know like just 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 who they are and it became beautiful and it became a real person i don't know am i rambling now i feel no, like no you make sense i got a, no, I got a little no, bit nervous i got a little of, nervous. no no it's part of your legacy right it's when you look back mm-hmm. at everyone that you've played in the past and how you have taken these characters and brought bring them to life you yeah. Know, what did they actually mean to you before it actually meant something to an audience who's, who's watched it? So I, I can appreciate that 100 percent. I'm sorry, Victoria, go. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. I was just I, I feel like I've heard about on these kinds of Disney and Nickelodeon shows, they do a lot in terms of controlling the performance. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know that but i i feel like, formulaic. like there's like yeah. there's it's so formulaic you know you're 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 a part of that that it, it's just very interesting and exciting to hear um yeah how acting became like or the the joy of it became more integrated into where your interests are because i think yeah. it is it, what you said like it's so it is it's your art you know it's it's so a product of you and 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 your experience, you know, we only know what we know. So I don't know. I just like, I'm, I'm excited for you and, and more of that. Cause and that's I, the joy I, of it for me. And I would barely even say that like I was a Disney kid or a Nickelodeon kid just because mm-hmm. like, I wasn't a series regular ever on Disney or Nickelodeon. I was always recurring and I was always very heartbroken over that and slightly bitter. <laughs> I was like, wow, you guys got invited to Disneyland for free. Amazing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, you know, And that goes back into the the no thing, right? And part of the whole process of acting was getting a lot of no's. And those no's can be a blessing. You know, one door closes, another one opens. And I've always found that, oh my God, if I was on that show, I would have never gotten this. And this right here is so much better. And it's really just God planning out your life and, and making the way for your destiny. So I feel like don't ever be afraid of no's and acting's pretty cool. So everybody should give it a try once <laughs> in a while. All this is making me think a lot about the importance of having a really strong collaborative leader on these sets. And Quentin, I'll throw this one to you first, but anyone can feel free to chime in. Because I was reading another interview you did where you were talking about how Liz, your uh, Tiny Beautiful Things showrunner, was just so incredibly supportive. So I'll give you a a complicated two-parter on that. Can you tell us something specific that Liz did for you that made her stand out as a showrunner and leader? But then can you also tell us about a time when a showrunner didn't give you what you needed and you had to you know step up and say something okay yeah yeah oh so to the first one I think you know this was my first time coming in as as a series regular you know so really having a a bit of the kind of beforehand conversations and stuff like that usually it's just coming in and you know kind of just saying what you need to say and, and doing the lines um but yeah you know a big part of this was us, uh, me and, and my wife character played beautifully by Catherine Hahn, um, being in a, a interracial relationship and raising a child in an interracial relationship. And um, I felt like for a while in some of the first iterations of scripts and stuff, there were things that were happening in the raising of, of the child, uh, of Ray, in ways that they were having me deal with it, where I was like, mm, I don't know if that sounds like a black father to me. Um, and so she was super open. She was like, okay, well, well what's up? What would we change? What would we do this, do that? And she was like, so, so generous about that conversation, you know, and, and me feeling really comfortable in anything I said or did from that standpoint, you know? And then when we had, you know, we had a set where, or, or a couple scenes and episode where we go to an Easter, you know, where it's around all of Danny's family and, you know, the, the black family, his family. And, you know, I had a lot of kind of say in some of the interactions there. And she was always open and always asking questions, and even if it wasn't something like that, even if it was just like, you know, how I felt in the therapist's office or how I felt, you know, about 
Claire or Catherine Hahn's brother in the show. It's just things like that. And if I wanted to improv, she was always open for that and things that I wanted to throw in or had on my chest to say. Um, and sometimes we didn't use it, you know, sometimes it wasn't whatever, but she was always open to it happening. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I've, there was times where I've been on sets where it, was, it wasn't, you know, Disney per se, but it was something that I felt was very form form. Victoria said it much better than I did. Um, but yeah, you know, it was a, a formula and it was something they're going for. And I, I remember it was like, my character was just dealing with some really deep stuff. And they kept acting me, asking me to make these like just cheeky jokes. And one time I was just like, no, he wouldn't say this. Like, why am I like, I'm dealing with this. And my, I lost my father and, you know, we're searching for him and going through all this. Like, why do you keep making me say these cheeky jokes and I, you know, I just kind of let it out uh, I was really comfortable on set at that point because my first time so I'm usually not you know like that but I just let it out and it was perfect because the person directing that um particular episode he was usually the uh first AD so he knew us very well he was there all the time and this was kind of his shot to direct an episode and he was just so incredible and he was just like yeah don't do it we'll throw it out and it was just like that. And I knew it was something that the network wanted. Um, you know, uh, and part of the reason, this was the same show that I ended up turning the series regular down for. Um, and it was just like really cool. I, I personally haven't had a situation where, uh, i take that back. I have had one situation where I didn't love the director and it wasn't a good connection. But other than that, every time that I've been on set has been really whatever I need, you know, has been given to me eventually whether I had to kind of yell and scream about it or whether we had just a nice easy conversation about it beforehand uh, I've been really blessed in that I've been on great sets um that have been you know very uh nurturing creatively um yeah either it comes naturally or it's something you have to ask for I feel like, yeah, like yeah. both avenues are, are well worth discussing and being for viable sure. options I can't remember what we were talking about before recording that made me think of this, but Wilmer, the last time we spoke was for Blast Beat at Sundance. And like we already pointed out, you've had two very long running shows. You're a busy guy. What do you look for when it comes to a project like that, that signals to you, here's a first time feature director that's worth taking a chance on. And also here's a project with, you know, a bit of an uphill battle in this industry that is worth taking a chance mm -hmm. on. Victoria, are you okay? We're Esteban. <laughs> I just did a movie with him. Oh uh, yeah, no way. I oh, love it. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a joy. Those guys are so fun. They're really, really smart. That's so cool. Well, yeah, so you know, so when it comes to making those type of choices, you know, sometimes when you're in like a TV show, it's just like what what is fitting in this pocket that I can just not take a hiatus and and then give give my vacation up for this moment, you know? And I always look for, you know, for, for something that either I have never done before that I can challenge myself in playing something I've never shown, you know? Um, also, I also think about, is this story important to be told, you know? And, <clears throat> you know, at my... At my at this time of my career, at this place, at this moment in time that I'm blessed to experience in my career, what's most important to me is what am I saying when I show up to a project? <clears throat> what am I leaving behind? What is my daughter gonna see? Uh, that my why was of saying yes to this project. So um, thankfully, there's a lot of very thoughtful stuff being made today. Um, and I also think um, when you have uh, some of us, you know, who have had some type of success in bringing characters uh, to life in different characters, they really empower you to, to kind of help shape, you know, the voice of either the character or the movie and stuff. So that stuff is, um, you know, that's, uh, that stuff is really important to me. So when you have a collaboration, you meet with a director and they're like, what are your ideas? And you're, you're like, these are my ideas before you even get to set and they take your ideas and they manifest them in the script and stuff. That's not only a good indicator, you're going to have a really fun, creative uh, process. Um, so those are big factors uh, for me. Um, and, and when my characters, it's just like, you know, when I did Blast Beat, that was, you know, like this, technically that was the first time me playing a father before I became a father, right? And then like that summer, my lady, you know, gave me the news at Father's Day that we were expecting a child. And I was like, oh my God, now I'm a really a dad. It's so cool, you know? 
Um, but so those type of things, you know, and to your point, when like I had to also talk about what is a Latino dad would do in this situation, you know, and, and those, type, those type of collaborations are always very fruitful. Um, does that answer your question or did I just go to a different place? You guys keep saying that. You're giving such thoughtful, insightful answers. You're crushing it. I'm going to use that as an excuse to go back to you, Victoria, because you have that project with Esteban coming up and also something really exciting sounding with Ava DuVernay. So for for you right now, what is something that's fairly recent and new in terms of what you're looking for and the types of stories you want to tell and the types of onset experiences you want to have? I like things that are really high concept I like when people take risks um, you know it's a movie not a play you know what can we do in this uh, medium that is like unique to it um, so that is always very exciting to me I like talking about things that are more taboo I think that's far more interesting than hearing the same old thing um, yeah and people that are like open and receptive to collaboration, like Walmart said, like, I, I think it's supposed to be fun too. It, it, like, it, like Quentin said, Robin Williams. Oh no, Wilmer said, Robin Williams said that. Yeah, like, of course, it's like, I went to theater school, it's a play, it's play, it's, it's right, fun, right, right, it is supposed right. to be joyful. And so, um, yeah, people that wanna be playmates, you know, it's, it's, it's serious, there's a lot of, you know, money there's a lot of time like the stakes can get really high but people that can handle that stress you know gracefully it's, it's sometimes hard to tell but something that it seems like it's going to be a good time another rule that somebody once told me my my friend's father he said you get you want two out of three things and you know we've been talking about money a little bit but it you have to make a living money mm-hmm. um the people and the project, the subject matter. And if you can get two out of three of those things, you're doing really well. <laughs> oh, <sure. Yeah. laughs> that's true. I think that's, that's true. true. Yeah. <laughs> a solid checklist right there. I have to let you all go soon. And I'm going to end with my new favorite, probably overly sentimental question. But this is an industry where we give out to awards to our peers in this industry, which I love. But I don't think we tell ourselves good job nearly enough. So for each of you looking back, can you pinpoint one scene? Then when you think back to that scene, you could say to yourself and believe it like, damn, I am proud of what I did there. Um, yeah, I guess I guess if you if my ladies don't don't mind, I guess I'll, I'll start first. Um, there was one moment where my character on that 70s show, and this was a big, big, like breaking point, not breaking point, but it was a, really, a, a world building moment for me uh, where uh, my character in the first season, he had like one or two lines a, an episode sometimes. And sometimes in that first season, I would have one line in a full scene, but everything was meant to be a joke. Right. So it's like everything was funny. Like if I'm if I if a voice came out of me, it was because it was going to make the audience laugh. Like I was weaponized in that way. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, this scene is about plot. Put, you know, put Wilmer in there, give a bunch of funny lines, make the people laugh and then we can move into the funny scenes, you know. And so I had this really specific job in that first season. And then, you know, the, the creator, Bonnie Turner, comes up to me and she says, um, she says, hey, um, can you dance? And I said, can I dance? <laughs> Absolutely, I can dance. I mean, please put me in, you know? And so, so she started laughing and she goes, okay, we have an episode that's coming out that might be funny, whatever. So anyway, she wrote this very notorious disco episode where the six kids go to a disco in Kenosha. And in that scene, um, basically, um, we went to this thing and none of the boys want to dance really, you know, and, uh, and Mila Kunis, who played Jackie Burkhardt, um, basically there wants to dance, but Kelsa doesn't. So, um, my character gets up and takes her out to dance and they, they did this really elaborate, you know, choreography between her and I, where I just came in sliding through the dance floor and on my knees right into the camera <laughs> and I really do feel like that was the moment when I was able to show that I was um more than what everyone expected my character to be if you remember from the 90s and the 80s if you had a character that was this gimmicky 
you will never see him again after that. So I kind of committed to myself to, to show as much range within my character as I could and just tell the producers, make me sing, make me dance. Like I'll do my own stuff. I'll do the fake, you know, dream sequences. And, and, and uh, they put me in everything. So I was able to show this versatility to this character that he became more than, <clears throat> you know, some of his iconic characters that would somehow be compared to him. And uh, so that was a big moment for me. And, and actually uh, it helped my confidence. It made me even more fearless as an actor. And then I started coming up with the weirdest choices. <laughs> and, and that became what, what Fez was known for. So how unpredictable and weird he is. And, and I carry that through my career. So I think that that was a big moment for me. Example. Who else has one? I'm making everyone sing their own praises before I let you go. I, I have a I have a few. I've tried to be better about um, you know, I used to be a type of person that like, no matter what I did, no matter if anything went well, I was always too focused in the future, you know. So I wouldn't actually enjoy anything as it happened, you know, because I'd always be like, well, you know, you got to get this, you got to be some movie star, you got to get this, you're not here yet. But I've been lately looking back on things, and and since we're talking about dance, I'll go to that one. Um, when I got welcome to Chippendales, like I, I'm not a dancer, you know, I'm not like 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 Wilmer said he was ready. I was like, I can kind of do it. I got rhythm, you know. I can do the electric slide at the film reunion. That's about <laughs> it. Um, so I had, you know, I had trained for like two months going into this thing every day, you know, five days a week for hours every day, and like really put a lot and like it gotten broke down times where I was even crying, you know, I didn't bleed, but sweat and tears. And, uh, you know, we get to the first day and it's all these incredible, uh, all of our background dancers were, you know, real dancers done this their entire lives. But this first day it's me by myself, a solo in front of hundreds of women expecting, oh, you know, me to entertain them. Right. Also, I had told them, I was like, look, now I am not good. Like when you all switch up choreography, it throws me off. So when we get within a week of the actual filming, lock this thing down, like the choreography, because I kept changing it to fit my body. And so we get to the final day and it was supposed to be boom, me dance, cut. My clothes are now off, go to the little strip section we have at the end of my clothes already off. And of course the director, who's, who's an incredible director, I love uh, Matt. And um, he was like, you know what? I think you should do the actual stripping in the middle of it. Yeah. And I'm like, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so we had to figure out the choreography on the day after I told them, do not switch it up. On the day of, of me getting, and this was before we had the breakaway pants, I had to, like, actually take my pants off and, you know, get my shoes off, all this kind of stuff. And the first time we did it, you know, like, lights came on, solo hit, and I heard the crowd, and I just, like, exploded in a way that I hadn't done any times in um in rehearsals that I hadn't done yet and I loved it and then I got like addicted almost to the high of like being on stage and doing this and it went fantastic and of course the actual stripping off which was like kind of improvised on the day was the best part of it was the best part of it when you actually saw it and it was one of those things where like I've always wanted to be an actor where I had to train a skill to put it on camera. It was something mm -hmm. I always had a fantasy of doing. And I remember when I was in the rehearsals, I called my sister one time and I was like, wow, Lex, I'm actually like knocking out just yet another fantasy I had as a kid of wanting to do this. Um, and so having the actual application of like mm -hmm. doing this, making it work, dancing and stripping on camera, what I never would have thought I would have stripped on camera before. I never would have thought I would strip here, but definitely not on camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, uh, and to do it and to be successful and to really feel empowered by it and really feel like I was being Otis and like, yeah, this guy is the best dancer at the club. It now makes sense. You don't just need movie magic to make it work. It was just one of those times where it's like, man, like, you know, like I'm here and, and I'm on a set with, you know, a person that at the time he hadn't yet, but I'm like, I know he's about to win the Emmy for White Lotus and I'm here with Kamel and all these people and Juliet who's been nominated for an Oscar. And like, but right now it's like all eyes on me and I'm actually earning that. And it was just so validating um, and just 
just fun too. So That's yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing that, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Who's going next? <laughs> Victoria, bring it down. I'm waiting to bring see. Get down, Victoria. Tell us how great you are. <laughs> we all love you. Um, I mean, I think this all speaks to how confidence is key. Mm -hmm. Um, I, 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 I just it's an, at a certain point it becomes a little bit of a choice. <laughs> it's just like pressure's on now. Cameras are rolling. Let's go. Um. Yeah, learning skills that you hadn't learned before. I had to learn how to, I had to, I've said that I knew how to ride a horse. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that part of it. <laughs> uh, when I was auditioning for uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um, all of my scenes, I am, well, I really am in that movie for like one minute. <laughs> I guess I'm in another one, but I don't even know where I am in the background. Um, <laughs> hey, you were in the movie, all right? Yeah, I yeah, was in yeah. it. Yeah, that, that counts. <laughs> We we weren't in that movie. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't I ride was, a horse. Yeah, I wasn't directed by Quentin Tarantino. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had to learn. I, I so I said I know how to ride a horse. I did not. I had to ride a horse for my callback. So I had to prepare for the callback to ride the horse. I'm being given sides like the day of the callback or the day I am shooting that are slightly different from the ones I had learned. You know, like it's it's it was a lot of pressure you know and it's film also it's not oh, yeah. digital oh, yeah. it's like expensive um you know uh the horse was amazing professional mm. did everything i told it to do it was really on me to have the confidence to guide mm. this horse around while i'm saying these lines that are slightly different anyway it got so done i don't i don't mean to cut you off you you rode a horse in the callback i had to i Oh, this is the craziest thing. Yeah. I had a callback while they were already shooting the film. So oh. I'm like meeting with the, the wrangler, getting on a horse and riding a horse onto set while Leonardo DiCaprio is on a horse and they're rolling and shooting the movie. What? It was, it was, it was wow. pretty wild, but yeah, I did it well enough to get the part. And then, uh, he didn't get me from the movie. So yeah. that's nuts. That's awesome. That's story. That's awesome. Yeah. I you also love the fact that we get to learn new skills. Of course, I'm picturing you like in walking into an audition room on a horse, like not actually on set, like into uh, the room. But yeah, we're still, out that's, in the middle that's, of nowhere on these like old historic sets that they shot all these cowboy yeah. movies on. That's incredible. Yeah, that was cool. Wow, that's wow. awesome. All right, Jalen, it's time yep. for you to take us home. Me trying to follow up with the Leonardo DiCaprio seed. <laughs> um, okay, so, <laughs> but, ooh, you know, I guess I wouldn't, I mean, it's difficult, I feel like, as an actor to be like, I was proud of that, because you kind of always know it's not really you. But I would say when I look back at Free Rain when I was about 18 or 19, um, I felt like in the moment, I didn't appreciate what I had um, surrounding me and what I was in and what it meant. And I guess what I'm now proud of myself for is the whole series and it being, you know, the first, you know, Afro Latina, Afro Hispanic hey. girl to on Netflix to have her own children's TV show. Hey. And I feel like I'm really proud of that now. And I wish, I really wish in the moment I, I owned it and I knew what it was and I knew what it meant to people. And I felt like I took advantage of it. And I think the whole lesson for me here is, you know, to appreciate what I have when it's right in front of me. And Quinn, I feel like I'm very similar to you in the fact of like, okay, what am I doing next? What is the next job? I and mean, I'm not looking at what I just did. And I mean, I guess that's, that's what I'm proud of is the whole the whole series, the whole the whole shebang. Hey, uh, hey. Jeff and Victoria, Quentin, I can't wait to follow you all and to root for you. And uh, if you ever need anything from me, you know how to find me. All love to you guys. And uh, let's let's keep it connected, man. We, yeah. we got to root for one another. We got we to gotta push each other out there, man. So whatever uh, you do is around. 100%. This was awesome. I'm so nice meeting everybody, honestly. Yeah, yeah seriously. I'm yeah. very much shook at um, being with all of you. I'm not going to lie. I watched everybody's TV shows prior. So I'm like, oh, Lord, look at y'all. You guys are amazing. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going on Instagram to find y'all right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome, guys. Take care. All right. Bye.